our fourth meeting for the Eaton Lakeview uh, 40B proposed um, development. Uh, we have a number of issues to discuss this evening, and uh, as promised, you will get more than sufficient time to uh, react to, make comments on, or ask questions of uh, the developer um, or other representatives here this evening. Um, I'll dispense with the reading of the the actual petition. Uh, we've heard it three times. This would be the fourth, so I think I'll bypass that. Uh, our first order of business um, is to uh, review a little bit what we did the last time around. So I'm going to ask uh, Andrew um, or Gene just to give us an update of where we are um, from the last meeting, which was held in July. Thank you, uh, Jean Delios. I uh, basically want to just briefly kind of go over where we were. Um, July 18th was when we met last, and this again is the Zoning Board of Appeals continued public hearing for Eaton Lakeview Apartments 40B project. Um, we reviewed Green International's uh, traffic peer review, the study and their findings on July 18th. We discussed the revised development proposal uh, and the updated plans. And um, there was a, some small amount of comment, public comment, and then the hearing was continued until September 5th tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, we have received a memo from the fire chief that was dated 7-26-18. Uh, we did hold a meeting, a workshop, with the development team, Green International, our traffic consultant, the peer review consultant, town staff, and representatives from the neighborhood. Um, that was held on August 14th at uh, Attorney Rignante's office. Um, at that meeting, we did go deeper into the traffic studies and uh, both the applicant's engineer and the town's peer review engineer commented on um, some of the recommendations. Since uh, the workshop, we have received a list of proposed waivers that was submitted on August 28th and a en draft engineering peer review scope of work has been exchanged. Staff prepared that as we were directed and the applicant has redlined it and made some comments. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. The first, in my mind, the first order of business is um, two things. We have some new information presented to us relative to the traffic that was discussed on the uh, um, August the 14th. Um, and we wanted to give everybody an update on that so that we can discuss it again tonight. Uh, we also have some information that was presented to us and Jean referred to some of that, including the letter from the fire department, which we will take up. Uh, we will then um, get any, take any questions from the board um, to the uh, developer and our, um, our own peer evaluator on that, and then we'll move forward. So the first thing I would like to do is to get an update of what happened. Um, I know that Ted is not here tonight, so I guess I will go back and ask uh, Jesse if he would uh, preface for that and the, I, I believe that the two engineers together uh, both uh, Wing and Kim are going to address their actual reports and the information that was discussed at the um, meeting on the on the uh, 14th of August so I think I'm going to start there Jesse do you want to take it from there? Yes thank you Good evening, members of the board, uh, town planning staff, town council, members of the public. My name is Jesse Schomer, attorney Jesse Schomer, 401 Edgewater Place, Wakefield, one of the attorneys for the project. 
Uh, since the last, since last we met, as as Gene noted, uh, the team and our traffic engineer specifically met with uh, members of the neighborhood group, who's represented here tonight by Boriana Milanova. Uh, Mr. Jarima, Chair, uh, Acting Chair of the Zoning Board, uh, and Green International's Peer Review Engineer, uh, Wing Wong. Uh, we thought that that was a very productive meeting. A lot of agreements came out of that meeting, and I won't, uh, I won't bore the members of the public with my amateur engineering skills. I'll leave that up to uh, Kim and to Wing to, to go over what agreements we've reached. There were a number of things that, a small number of things, I would say, that were left unresolved, and those are to be determined, and, and Kim can go over those. But I'll uh, I'll turn it over to the to the two engineers. That. Thank you, Chairman. Hey, good evening. I'm uh, Kim Hazabardian with uh, TEF LLC Traffic Engineer. Um, so essentially, uh, there were a number of technical uh, points uh, that uh, the Green International commented on, and we uh, responded to the comments. Uh, and uh, the technical points regarding trip generation and capacity analysis software, <coughs> and a few other things. Uh, are, uh, I think we're in, in uh, agreement on that. Uh, and uh, we also uh, provided uh, crash rate calculations uh, for the uh, Walkersburg Drive General Way intersection. Uh, and uh, those rates actually are below uh, statewide and uh, Mass DOT District 4 averages, so that's complete. Uh, I believe there are two things to discuss tonight. Uh, one would be uh, the fence at the apartment complex uh, next door, and the other would be uh, the nature of uh, improvements on uh, Walkersbrook Drive uh, in the long term for the town of Reading. And I'd uh, like to also say that the uh, additional crash uh, analysis that was performed by Kim, uh, we did take a review of that, and those calculations um, were done per industry standards, and uh, we agree with those numbers that came up. Um, I guess I'll take this one sure. first. Uh, regarding the fence, uh, we made a peer review comment about um, the adjacent uh, property fence that could restrict site distance uh, for the new proposed driveway um, during our workshop. Um, that was discussed extensively, and um, it was agreed that the developer would work with the um, uh, the resident uh, next door to try to address that um, fence and removing a piece of it. And uh, but that discussion will be. Uh, um, for to me uh, as we as the project move along I guess that's my understanding um, and then the next piece would be uh, the improvements potential improvements at the um, Lakeville at uh, Walker's Brook intersection um, from our peer review comments is that you know additional studies should be performed uh, to potentially uh, improve safety as well as mitigate the um, additional traffic that is projected to use uh, Lakeville um, the agreement uh, and we heard a lot from the neighborhood group um, is that the consensus to provide a more in-depth study, more of a, a area-wide study, a corridor study, uh, rather than just look at this one individual's intersection. Um, the neighborhood group, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I uh, felt that that would probably result in a, in a, in a better product at the end. Um, so um, I guess going forward, um, you know, we'll be uh, prepared, uh, look at the scope uh, of what that study should be, and then, um, I believe the town will work with the developer to see uh, how much that um, will be working together to uh, facilitate that study. Uh, my understanding is that the uh, applicant will be contributing uh, to that study. The final amount, I think, is still will be determined. Correct. So I think at this time, um, those stuff will be addressed as the project um, advances forward. Uh, and I, I have nothing else for right now, do you? No, I think those are the big uh, issues that we talked about uh, in the peer review as well as at the workshop. Um, and I think that's kind of where we left it, um, I guess at this time. If I could just, just add to a couple of points there. On the, the issue of the fence that, that the engineers were discussing, the, the issue there was a site distance problem. And the concern that we have is the fence which, which is right along the property line, is, is not actually our fence. So we can't just take it down without, without 
the neighbor's permission. So we will be working with the neighbor to, to do what we can with that. Although it, you know, that, that will depend on what the neighbor's willingness to agree to that. With respect to the, to the study of the, the wider area, that's something that I would suggest be left to be determined at or following the DRT meeting, which we have scheduled with town planning staff today, which is going to be taking place, I believe, October the 3rd. Am I right about that, Gene? Yes. So we'll, we'll, we'll have all, all of our engineers, our architects, and uh, traffic engineers there as well. And that's something I think we can we can maybe narrow some of the issues in terms of what the what the study, what the corridor should be in the study, and, and what the town staff thinks appropriate for contribution to that study. Gene, uh, would you um, talk about a little bit? This appears to be. Um, if you were there, if you were there at the uh, the workshop, all of this would be crystal clear to you. But you weren't, and neither was the board. Um, so I'm going to ask Jean if she would give uh, what she perceives as from the town's point of view. And we also had one of the engineers from our own engineering department. Uh, there that evening too, and he wrote a just a quick paragraph, but he was very instrumental in that discussion also. So I'll turn it over to Chief. Sure. Thank you. Um, so what we discussed was um, how do we manage these additional vehicle trips, and what is the best approach for dealing with that. And um, in the peer Green's peer review, there were three recommendations. The first one was to signalize Lakeview and uh, where it meets Walker's Brook Drive. Uh, the neighbors, I understand, are, are in opposition to that. At least there's a fair amount of opposition to that. The second recommendation had to do with John Street and, and extending John Street into Lakeview. Again, we heard that neighbors were not happy with that either. Um, the third thing was restricting left-hand turns from Lakeview to Walkersburg Drive, which I know is also very unpopular. So we're faced with a set of recommendations that probably from a technical point of view make a lot of sense, but the reality is um, it doesn't seem like there's much support for any of those. So rather than um, beat those recommendations around more, the discussion at the workshop turned to perhaps we should be looking at this in a more holistic way. And we should be thinking about um, planning uh, in a more uh, wider net of what's going on with the traffic and not just focusing on this one intersection at the end of Lakeview. So that's the nature of kind of how the discussion evolved at the workshop. And we talked about the town staff applying for grants. We talked about the developer um, making a financial contribution to this study. And this study would be something that would likely be more of a long-term plan and approach to this area. It likely would not be something that we're going to begin uh, in time for the uh, comprehensive permit that, we're, as you know, we're on a deadline for. So, um, so the idea is that we would um, look at this, and as uh, Jesse mentions, there will be a what we call a development review team meeting. We've had two of them on this project, and the notes are on the website if anybody hasn't had a chance to look at them. And basically what these meetings are is they're more like an in-house workshop with all of the department heads, the fire chief, the police chief, the town engineer, and we sit around a table with the applicant and we start discussing issues and um, get feedback and comments from important um, colleagues of mine like the fire chief and the police chief. Um, and so we feel like that's another opportunity to get everybody together and continue this conversation about how do we deal with traffic in a more holistic way. I think that's essentially um, what we ended up with. Um, the uh, town engineer's comments, as was stated, were uh, very helpful. 
Um, the town engineer will pay, play a very strong role in crafting the solution. And um, I think that with lots of people working together, we will figure out the best thing for the neighborhood. Um, we did talk a little bit about some other things to do with um, the loading zone and uh, whether or not we needed an architectural review and um, and then we ended up with um, the requesting the list of waivers which we got and and then getting the um, civil engineering scope of work uh, red line which we also got so I think we accomplished a fair amount in a short workshop and I'm glad to have made some progress. Um, I was also there um, as one representative of the board, just listening to um, all the input that was made. Um, just as one member of the board, I came away with a few questions myself. And I know the board, hearing some of that this evening, may have questions of either the two engineers or uh, Gene um, or myself, but what I came away with um, from that meeting, which was about a good two hours, um, was that there is a difference in the models that was, were studied by the two engineers. Um, there was a difference. The unfortunate part I heard from uh, Wing, from Green, uh, when he indicated um, that with a development down there, regardless of how many units, uh, there's going to be increased traffic. We don't have, or there is nothing in the state models right now to project <coughs> what that would look like. However, um, I think the comment that was made, and I, I think agreed to by both of the engineers, it'll represent at least a twofold um, upwards of a fourfold increase in traffic at the intersection of Walker's Brook Drive and um, Lakeview. So that needs to be looked at also. And the three solutions that came up um, were just three of the solutions. And we're looking at that in terms of what the best way to handle it is. We have a deadline, or we will have a deadline, to make a decision on this particular project. The solution to the complete solution to that intersection and perhaps others may not be completed by that time. So how do we deal with it? That's a question mark. From my standpoint of view as one member of the board, my concern is we will come up with a partial decision on a solution for that intersection. Um, before we move on and vote on that on the project the rest of it can be forthcoming over time as we do the studies and we have to put a time limit on it also that's what's in the back of my mind as just one member of the board so I'm reporting back again to my board members and to anybody here before we get started um, I will then ask uh, if there's questions that the board members have of the engineers or Gene before we move on. <coughs> no? Eric? No. Ty? Uh, just an observation. Can you hear me? Uh, I appreciate... Is that on? Yep. Yeah. I appreciate the effort that's gone on since July, well, the July meeting. But uh, I'm a little disappointed, and perhaps we haven't made as much progress as I really anticipated and expected we would make. Uh, this is a this traffic issue is an interesting problem, and frankly, I don't think whatever solution we come up with is going to make everybody happy. There is no universal solution to please the world. Uh, whatever it is, there's going to be disappointment. Uh, I may be disappointed myself in that I don't see what I'd like to see either. Uh, and now we're talking about a longer term solution which says it won't be done by the time we have to act and sign off on whether we proceed with this project or not. Uh, but I guess, I guess I'd like to throw out on the table that 
pending a longer term solution are there short term things that can be done whether they be temporary or not that may just help alleviate uh, what we're trying to solve and uh, I would hope that we could uh, in, the, in trying to get to, a, to an answer to these questions that we uh, roll up our sleeves and commence talking about solutions more than defining the problem or talking about the problem. Um, time is running out. I mean, I think we're faced with a decision on this case first of the year, February maybe. Um, I could have it done by February. February is right around the corner, believe it or not. It'll be here before we know it. And so we've got to start focusing conversations down to conclusions and solutions. And uh, I appreciate the effort that everyone has done. Uh, I just like to see us move it a little more rapidly. Thank you. I'm all set, John. I'll, uh, I'll wait till I okay. see more. If I could make, can I respond to that? Absolutely. Um, I just, uh, just briefly, that suggestion was discussed briefly at the, at the, at the workshop that we had. Can you speak up, please? Yeah. The microphone. Thank you. The issue of uh, temporary measures was something that we discussed briefly at the workshop that we had with the traffic engineers. One of the things that uh, I don't recall who suggested it, the suggestion was that we implement one of these measures that, uh, that Wayne and Kim have discussed in terms of the, the three options that Gene outlined, such as limiting left turns from Lake Avenue onto Walker's Drive. The concern, and I'll let the neighbors speak for themselves, was that a temporary measure such as that could become permanent in, in the future in terms of if there's not initiative on the, on the part of the town or on the part of uh, the public to, to implement whatever changes need to be made because certainly I think no one would disagree that the changes that need to be made in terms of the corridor of Walker's Work Drive are fairly extensive. It's a, it's a, it's a large area that will need to be studied um, and potentially extensive changes made. Um, these changes go well beyond the scope of this project and that's, that's been our position all along. But we are, as Kim mentioned, going to contribute to it. So in terms of an interim measure, I, that, that's something we would, we would be willing to, to agree to. Uh, probably a left-hand term uh, limitation would be something that, that could work and the engineers could, could discuss that. Um, any thoughts on that, Kim? One, one thought would be, uh, one, while the percentage increases sound big in the area, uh, do the project. The actual numerical increases aren't aren't that big. Uh, the volumes on Lakeview are, are fairly low, so it doesn't take very much traffic added to create a big percent increase. Uh, one pragmatic approach might be to monitor what's going on there and uh, only do a temporary left turn restriction if the problem uh, materializes and is amenable or susceptible to correction by that restriction. In other words, only start limiting how people can move uh, on a temporary basis uh, if the if the need is actually realized either you know more so than engineers running models and so on might also just add to that uh, you know any of those uh, potential improvements uh, we also recommend it just accompanied by a study as well to make sure that that would actually something that would work out well so it's not just pick one and implement it a study should probably go with that as well and, and uh, the only one that is amenable to a short-term improvement is, is the, out of the list that's been mentioned so far <coughs> would be the left turn restriction uh, there might be other simple things out there but if anything happens involving signal or road relocation uh, that would be a very a very major undertaking that would, would, would take a long time to do to implement. Thank you, don't go away. Um, what we will do is um, we've heard that there are very few questions from the board or, or clarifications. We have an input um, from town representatives, um, staff. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, getting some input feedback from the 
um, neighborhood and from people of Reading. Um, so I would ask that, um, that you just raise your hand. I'll recognize you. I would like you to uh, give me um, your name and your address. And if you have a question, to whom the question is going to. Um, and then uh, would you try to be succinct in, in the questions or comments that you have. And I'm going to first start off with uh, Boriana, since she has been more or less uh, somewhat of a representative from the community that started this whole thing. So, um, oh, do you want to? I was not prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Boriana Milano, 194 Eaton Street. Uh, I want to thank everybody, uh, like the developer, uh, the development team, town staff, and also the board that we've been included in the discussions. That's really great, and I've been trying to keep people informed about about what it was discussed. So it's not complete news when they come and hear this. Uh, I just want to reiterate a couple of the things we. we brought to the meeting, to the workshop. So we feel strongly that restricting left turn is a bad idea because the traffic will go through the neighborhood. That is the last thing we want to see. We are open to the wait and see approach, which was mentioned, especially given that the traffic engineers have studied the numbers and their projection, which is based on statistics, is that now it's below um, the state averages. So we're willing to wait, and we're really hoping for a comprehensive solution. We think that uh, we've heard that from town staff. We've heard it from our um, elected representatives. So everybody seems on board, recognizes there is a situation. I've also heard from lots of people they want an improvement for the general way intersection. People want to do left turn. So if this comes out of this, that would be a great outcome for the neighborhood. So let's try to look at it in a positive way. More traffic is not, a, not great, but maybe we'll fix this intersection. Maybe it will become more functional. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I do want to say, if you did not hear it the first time, the developer has proposed that if we're talking about a, a longer range study between or in beyond the decision that's made on this project, um, that they, the team, the development team, would be more than um, interested in um, subscribing to that financially. Um, what the numbers are, we have no idea. We're, we're looking at that now in terms of further study, in terms of the traffic. We don't come to you this evening with solutions. We came with alternatives, and these are just three of the alternatives. There are a number of others that perhaps further study uh, will, will yield. We don't have them as of this point. So again, uh, if you want to speak, raise your hand. I'll recognize you. Um, I'll do as much best I can. I want to try to get to everybody. I'll start right here. <coughs> Matt Holman, 11 Beach Street. Um, I just wanted to first say thanks to everyone who's worked on it from all realms. My wife and I are very happy with what has started with a huge facility to a much smaller area now. Um, we just wanted to first up point uh, back up Oriana and the neighborhood on the left turn. Um, I want to point out two things, and I think everyone in the neighborhood probably knows this, but others may not. Within the last eight months, at the end of Green Street and 28, a no left-hand turn for a right turn only sign was put up. Nobody listens to that. I drove by there yesterday to take a right turn onto Green Street. Two people in a row took a left, third person went straight across. Not happening there. General way, come out of market basket. All day long, people take a left turn and turn out of there. I don't see this, a left, putting a left hand turn sign there is gonna be ignored. It's not gonna happen. Uh, the only other suggestion I, I came up, I heard something tonight, I forgot about this from last meeting, was the fence sight lines. I think there's also, if one suggestion would be for the Lakeview, um, 
Walker's Brook, is I think there's a sight line issue there with the Salem 5 fence and the trees. Maybe as part of whatever we do, we can take them and you know, talk to them about the last panel, just one panel. I know I have, I have to pull out further than I really would like to safely to see where cars are coming from. Um, and, you know, so. Again, I wanted to say thank you for everything. Um, you know, the other thing with the little left turn there is John Street's gonna get backed up, and it's kind of a funky turn there, and it already gets backed up quite a bit. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kathy Bachner. I live in 41 Alley Eighth Street, um, which is a little bit removed from where you're actually talking about. It's halfway down Washington Street. So my question is, has anyone looked into or done a study about the traffic on Washington Street? So if you stop people from turning left onto Walker Books Drive, which turns into like a two-lane road there. You're sending it down a one a street that's one lane in one direction, each direction, into a neighborhood of homes with kids and families. I want to know, is that is that really what you think is the option, as opposed to sending it the other way? So everyone that wants to go to walk to Market Basket from Lakeview has to go through down Washington Street and around through the light there? I, I'm not sure I understand why that would be a, a good option. And I understand you're saying you're looking at it, looking at it, but I, I'm not sure I understand. So I'd like an explanation and what studies were done to, for this traffic on Washington Street if you're going to turn all of these cars, be they 50 cars, 80 cars, whatever, whatever they are. That's a lot of traffic on that street. A lot of walkers, a lot of people who walk to the train. I'm just not sure how that works out and why that would be the option. I'd, I'd like an explanation as to why that would be even an option. I, I'm not sure I understand. So if somebody could, I haven't really heard any explanations yet, so I'd like um, to hear somebody give me an explanation for why that would be feasible. So I'll let, I'll let Kim answer the, the technical. Let's see, does this one work? No, I no. guess it doesn't. I'll, I'll let Kim answer the, the technical question about whether Washington Street was was studied. It, it's all computer modeling in, in terms of what streets get studied in, in a study like this. You know, the, the difficulty in, in, in our job up here being, being the presenters of this project right. is to say that a project like this will have a very minor traffic impact. And, and I know that that sounds absurd to the neighbors who live in this traffic every day, but the two scientists up here have data that supports that, that the, the traffic impact of this project that's added to the, the neighborhood traffic is, is minor, it is very minor. Um, so Kim, the technical. Uh, we analyzed the study area that we did in our traffic study, which consisted of several intersections, and then the... Uh, what intersections were they? Oh, it was, um, it was uh, Eaton and... Uh, um, I'm laying it out here, uh, was it? By, by, by the ball field. Uh, and uh, then the uh, side driveways along Eaton and Lakeview, uh, and uh, Lakeview and uh, Walker's Brook, and, and John and Walker's Brook. And then uh, the town's consultant expanded the study area. Uh, and uh, within that study area, the project didn't make much of an impact. It made very little impact. And that's because. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt you, but I really feel like. You're getting sidetracked off my question. I'm asking you, Washington Street, that area, going to Main Street, was that specifically studied about the flow of traffic? That's all I'm, that's all I'm asking. I, I just want an answer. Okay, the answer goes, I'm getting there. Okay. I, I have to lay the groundwork here. Uh, that, that study area showed uh, very little impact and expanding the study area even more would, would continue to show very little, very little impact. Now. The, the answer is no, it was not studied. Okay, so um, you can't really add that into your, that it showed very little traffic impact because you haven't studied it. Oh, yes, I can. Uh, How be, is that? Because uh, the way the project traffic works, you have the traffic concentrated near the project. Right. And then as you get farther away, the, the traffic splits, it fans out. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, you know, for example, at Lakeview, uh, some of the traffic turns left and some of the traffic turns right. Uh, all the intersections basically are an opportunity for traffic to split up. So if there's no impact within that area closer to the site, 
then the impact is going to be less to the area outside. Uh, the numbers we're talking about are, um, are the type of numbers based on, on what I just explained and experienced. They're not likely to change uh, levels of service. The way we do these traffic studies, uh, we look at level of service as, as our measure of impact. Uh, and uh, usually it takes a, a, a much larger amount of traffic than we're talking about to change a level of service. So I can, I can say with, with certainty uh, that there would be no level of service impact where you're talking about. Now that being said, uh, you had a, a question I, I, I thought was important as well about the left turn being restricted out of, uh, out of Lakeview. And you're right, if the left turn is restricted, uh, those cars will go somewhere else. And uh, that's why... Well, there really will be no other option except Washington Street. Yeah. So, I mean, they can go down Green Street, but again, <coughs> to the end of Green Street, it is a right turn only. So that's not really... That kind of encumbers people's travel. So uh, I'm not quite sure why the traffic wouldn't be directed back towards out of town to the highway, which can take them up an exit. They can get on Main Street. I, I'm, just, I'm talking about the people who are going to be living in that facility. Or has it been even a thought to like what they did to Farmer's Way in Rubin is to make a road that would go over to 128, which might lessen some of the traffic in and out of that apartment complex. Because that's where a lot of people were desirable because of our access to 128, to 93, to the train. I mean, because then you have a 60 apartment complex going in on the other side that's by Washington Street. So that traffic has to be, where is that traffic being directed? And I know that's not your problem, but again, is that going to impact? I mean, because now you've got people who want to get down Washington Street to go to 128, to Market Basket, to Stop and Shop, to Home Depot, to Jordan's. I, I'm, I'm just not sure why you think that traffic will not impact a, a span of road that is not really developed to handle much more traffic. It gets, it gets blocked. I see it every day right. that it gets back Washington Street at certain hours. It's backed up all the way down. People can't turn off of Village Street sometimes because of the traffic. If anything happens on Washington Street, traffic on that street comes to a halt. So I'm just not sure. I'm not sure that you have answered my question. I understand you do the studies and all of the talk that goes around that, but I really am a plain meat and potatoes kind of gal. I want, a, I want just a direct answer. I don't want to hear this, that, or the Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take another crack at a direct answer. Okay, what we did was a traffic impact study uh, for, for our development, uh, and, uh, and, and we did it basically uh, going, in my opinion, beyond what, what would normally be required. So that's the impact of our development. Now you mentioned uh, the combined traffic of other developments in the area and bigger solutions than would generally be associated with one development. And that's what the long-term study would be about. Something where we could combine all the traffic and look at everything in a more global manner and not come up with solutions that, that, that might, uh, might work for uh, maybe, maybe this particular project uh, but would inconvenience other people, make everybody not be able to turn left out of, out of Walker Brook Drive. The long-term study would be a way of getting at the issues you are mentioning uh, and looking at things in terms of benefits and costs to whomsoever they may approve. Right, but I, I'm just saying again that if you come to an intersection like that and you have the choice of sending it down a one-lane road into a neighborhood on, on all sides as opposed to making people turn and go back, go out there on a two-lane road, which allows for more traffic to travel, a better flow, and they can get on the highway and come go one stop up. Or they can go out the back way, and I don't mean to say the back way, because I don't want the traffic to really impact anybody's neighborhood, quite frankly. It stinks all the way around, it's just be plain. 
Thank you, Kathy. Um, I, I know you want me to get down. That's okay. I will. Well, we have a lot of other people, and, and I have to reinforce the fact that this is not going to be decided tonight. We're just taking input from that, and the study is going to continue. We have not finished with this. It'll come up again and again before the end of the discussion on a final vote for the project. So it's not that we haven't over, we haven't gone, we've expanded that. Gene has already mentioned that, but I'd like to get any other people who are concerned about this, and I'll take, uh, again, same thing. Please, if you have a question to whom, your name and your address. I'll take one over here. My name is Kevin Sedetti. I'm the third of Smith Avenue for 45 years. Kevin. We didn't hear any of that here. <laughs> well, when you use a microphone, usually I'm bound <coughs> But in any event, my name is Kevin Signetti. I'm at 13 Smith Avenue for 45 years. Uh, I think what that means is I've seen a lot of uh, traffic increase in that area. My question, first question is, the statistic, statistical data that was given in reference to the crash study, I'm assuming that this is data that was taken from some sort of a survey or books that you have taken in the past or no? Either one is good. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have more questions, so you can just answer me. Okay, we're going to have to shift. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, the, it was from the uh, Mass DOT database. Okay. So I'm, Online. I'm assuming that if, when you've taken that information, what you've done is you've looked at the additional traffic that it's expected, and you've said, okay, as an example, another 300 cars, based on the number of cars that you had based on the SDOT, you would expect another two or three crashes per day, per week, per month. Is that correct? Uh, the way we do it is uh, we look at the number of crashes uh, over a five-year period, and look at the number of millions of entering vehicles over a five-year period, and we calculate a crash rate per million entering vehicles for that intersection, and uh, we compare that crash rate with statewide averages, or Mass DOT district averages, and we're in District 4 here, and we see if the crash rate is uh, below or above average. Okay, and the average period you're talking about five years? Okay, did you take a look at an escalation of the average crashes because of the fact that there are a number of cars, uh, increased number of cars over a five-year period of time? Uh, the standard procedure is to look at the, the uh, most recent five years of available data, and it comes up with a crash rate, and uh, if the crash rate is high, uh, that flags us potentially to look at things. That's not the answer to my question. My question was, did you use an escalator every year because you've had an increased number of cars? Or did you just average the five years? Okay, are you saying looking back, did we over have the past five years, over the five year period of time, right? Did you only average the five years as crashes? Or did you look at an escalating clause because of the fact that the numbers of cars that have come through each year have increased? We used um Okay, I can't, I can't answer your question. So the answer to the question is you didn't? No, I can't answer okay. that with a yes or no. Okay, what we do is we look at the uh, we look at the 2018 existing volume uh, from the traffic study, and we use those numbers for the, uh, as a base of calculating the number of million entry vehicles, and then for the number of crashes, we look back at the most recent five years of available uh, I'm data. sorry, I don't, I don't want to cut you short. I'm a numbers guy, so I know I heard you the first time. So okay. the answer to the question is, you didn't use an escalator. Uh, an escalator we use to look out in the future. You're talking about looking into the past, right? I'm talking about in the past because five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, one year ago. No, we apply just the numbers under 2018 existing conditions, okay. and we don't we don't change it okay. looking back. Okay. All right. Next question is: We have more stop signs in this area than Carter has peanuts. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about from, I'm on Smith Avenue. As I go up Smith Avenue, up to Eaton Street, and then to Green Street, within about a 200 yard period, we have four-way stop sign and a four-way stop sign, okay? 
We also have, when we get up to um, uh, Walkersburg Drive, we have another stop sign on Walkersburg Drive, or two Walkersburg Drive. If there is a proposal for no left turns, lights, flashing lights, stop signs, so forth and so on, that's not gonna work because people have stopped out. What I mean by that is they've seen stop signs, no left turns, no right turns, so forth and so on. And I can tell you first, and then another, one more question I have. Um, the statistical data was, did anyone physically stand there on the corner of Eaton and uh, Pleasant Street, or on the corner of Pleasant Street and Salem Street? Did they do it in the morning or in the afternoon? Did they do it during Little League uh, ball games? or non-literally ball games? Did they do it during the summer or did they do it during the fall? When did they take this information or was there something physically there to take the information? Uh, the way the accounts are done, there's either a person there or a video there, uh, and then a person looks at the video and it's done uh, typically for the morning peak hour on weekdays, seven to nine, it's the afternoon peak period on weekdays, four to six, and the Saturday midday peak period, maybe 11 to one or thereabouts. And uh, the way we conduct the analysis is we uh, take our volumes and convert to average month conditions, not peak month, average month. Okay, I can tell you, I retired, I am retired as of last, uh, last uh, August, I guess it was. Uh, although I retired, but I'm still doing uh, 12 hours, um, uh, 12 semester hours teaching during the week. But the point of the matter is, since I am technically retired, I've never seen anybody there on the corner of Pleasant and uh, Eaton Street. I've never seen anybody at the corner of Manny Street and Salem Street. I've never seen anybody at the corner of Salem Street and Eaton Street. Never. And as I say, 45 years. So the reality is, I have to tell you that it's likely to, in my opinion, that no one is there taking, taking the information. I'm saying you're lying. I'm saying somebody's lying to you. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. I would like, I would like, um, so that we all get a chance to um, discuss questions, vent, whatever. Did you limit it to one? And I'm going to try, try to hold everybody to three minutes until we get the first round through. Yes. Have to come up to the front. Do I have to? Yeah. Um, my name is Jeanette Keller, and I live at Five John Street. Um, so I guess I'm sort of thinking of the, the mic. I'm thinking of the lesser of the evils in terms of. It's, I feel like it's going to happen before the grocery stores were there and there was nothing there and then we had lights for that and whatever. Chicken. So I, while I was sitting there listening to you talk about all the different things that you thought would work, it seems like the cheaper alternative is to just put that sign there. So I and I agree. I don't want everybody to go the other way because if we're coming out of there and you want to go to work in the morning, you can get on 128. So is there a way to make putting a light there or something so that people have a choice. So now we're not, people can't complain about you're gonna put all the traffic into one neighborhood and then people get to sort of decide how they're gonna come out of their house in the morning. So I, I guess that's, I'm not asking you a question really, except to say that I guess when you said that to me, I felt like the person who lives in that neighborhood, you just sort of, put aside those other things because I, I know everybody's feels impacted by all of that anyway. But I live on John Street and I can tell you, I don't, like, if you want to study, you can sit in my living room when everybody leaves for work in the morning. I, I imagine it would just get worse. So I guess I would be asking you to figure out if it means more work to do something else that will make it better, then do more work. Does that make sense? It does. Would you like to respond? Sure. Okay. Um, if I said no, would you just do that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, none, of the, none of the ideas that have been floated by either either Wing or me are, are ones we're saying should be done. We're just we're just putting them out there mm -hmm. as possibilities uh, before before any of the ideas, especially the ones that take a long time to do. Uh, or involve a lot of infrastructure, like a signal or realigning roads happen. 
uh, the additional study needs to happen. And, and with that additional study, some things, in my opinion, would need to be considered. Uh, what's going to work best for the Walker's Brook Drive corridor? What's going to work for the neighborhoods? Is, is changing the traffic pattern going to force someone to go in front of somebody else's house? Uh, is putting in a light somewhere going to make that street more attractive and get extra through traffic to there? All those things need to be considered in, in a, a corridor study. Mm -hmm. I, so putting a light where there's already a light, you just need to put it on the other side. Okay, you're talking putting in a light at Lakeview. Oh. Okay, the neighbors, the neighbors on, on Lakeview have talked about that, attracting traffic through the neighbor, that part of the neighborhood. I believe I've got it. And, uh, and putting, I, I may have heard that, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the other thing is putting in a light there is isn't is, is actually pretty complicated uh, because uh, they have to have a whole separate signal phase uh, that could affect not only that signal but the timing of the other signals on the corridor which are coordinated with. So it's something that would require detailed analysis and design looking at things holistically because it would affect it would be the head bones connected to the neck right. bone and right. so on. Right. Thank you, John. Again, we had the, these are three solutions that came up as part of our workshop over a period of two hours. This is not necessarily the final decision. There are other options out there. That's why the study is going to continue. Both engineers have um, agreed to continue this, and it won't be just tonight that you're going to hear this. There are going to be other solutions that are forwarding down the road. And the whole process is not just for the late view Eaton Corridor. It's for the town of Reading. We all know that that is a troublesome intersection, but everybody uses it. So it's not just for the neighborhood, it's for everybody who, you, who lives here in Reading, too. And that has to be taken into account. And that's why we're doing this. We're going for further study, but I'd like to hear the uh, comments. We'll take one up here in the front. Uh, Patrick Smallwood, 91 John Street. Um, two quick questions and then maybe a minute long question. Um, just want to clarify, you guys are working for the developers of the town? Uh, developer, town. Okay, <laughs> good, that's good. Uh, second question, very personal, and I assume I know the answer already, but would you want this development in your backyard? <laughs> I don't think that's a, that's, I don't think that's a, a fair question. We're not talking about whether this is going to be in your backyard or not. We're talking about a 40B. You're not going to be asking about this. There's only two options. Either you accept something back there because it has come before the board, come before the town, and it's a working model. Um, we are through Safe Harbor in February of 19, so we're thrown back into it. We must do something. Or we can turn it down, in which case the developer can take it to the state and the state can say, well, you know, we don't think that 86 is appropriate. We think 135 is more appropriate. Then what would the neighborhood like to do then? This is an issue for the state. The state is in control of this. I have to say this. I can turn it over to Chris. <laughs> I know, I should do that. <laughs> but I mean, the issue is not just local, it is a state requirement. So we're trying to address all of this. This is not a your backyard project. This is the town of Reading and the Reading in the state of Massachusetts. So thank you. Uh, one last bit. Uh, so, and this is actually for the board, not the engineers. Um, you mentioned that it's you have to consider the whole town of Reading, right? I mean, folks coming and going from Market Basket, and Home Depot, and all the restaurants and whatnot. I like to say they're on their own time, right? So I feel like the people in the neighborhoods with children and pets and and jobs and, and livelihoods and property values and the, the folks that put their life savings into these homes. 
those people need to come before the, the casual shopper on Saturday or, or whoever else. I, I, I just don't see, that's, that's a false equivalency to me, to, to treat that Walkersburg corridor with the same importance as you treat these neighborhood streets. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. I've been living in Reading for over 50 years. And your name again? Maria Dingian. Maria. Uh, Street. Street. Uh, I think the simplest way is to put at the traffic line two ways, right and left and across. Because all the traffic, if you go to the right heading towards the center, Main Street, you can hardly get out of there not sometimes. So everybody has, if you can't turn right, either you go to the, into the center, or you go into the uh, market, uh, stop and shop, or you go across, and then go around and come out anyways to the left. So it's a simple thing to put a traffic light that first you can go left and right, or you go across. And I think that's a simple solution for something like that, because the traffic, if you go over towards the main center, you can hardly get out of time. Thank you, Maria. That's all I have to say. Okay. And I said it before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, my name is David Cannon, 30 Beach Street. Uh, I would like to change things up just a little bit. So I'll take a breath here. Uh, I have a question for the developer uh, in regards to that last meeting. Um, there was discussion about a loading zone, and I'm very concerned that there might be some possibility that a loading zone would take away from the green space. That was a possibility. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to limit the loading zone is further down the pike with the board. So when we get to that point, we can address that. What the impact is going to be on traffic and the rest of the development, yes. But I, I think what we're trying to do is to limit it this evening to the actual changes in the development plan that was presented by the development team and the traffic aspect of it, because that's the most pressing before us right now. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to just hold off on that one, bring that up a little bit later. All right. Thank you. So, Mr. Like, depending on what we talk about, where we go next with the peer reviews, I just thought we should kind of cover some of the issues of Is that possible? Because we discussed design, we discussed lots of things that people couldn't comment. So yes. I think it's fair to let people comment about those other issues. You can hear us. Okay. Um, Moriana would like to have it opened up a little bit further. Um, to things that we will not discuss engineering because we haven't even got the peer review yet. Uh, we will not discuss the architectural aspect. We have not got the peer review and we're going with that yet. We will not discuss issues related to um, landscaping. We're, we're not there yet. But the overall project, yes, um, the board has already made a statement about the loading zones. Um, that was an issue with our last 40B. It will probably be an issue on this one again. But in terms of the other other issues, if you want to uh, ask the developer something about the proposed, the changes in the proposed plan, that's fine. Can I say something about our workshop? Sorry, it's, it's about the workshop. So, so this has happened in the workshop, so it came up. We, we've been working very hard to increase the green space on the lake block because they're big buildings, there's lots of asphalt. So the developer very graciously agreed to have a pocket park in front, so they banked some space for parking but in the future, but they are very willing to create a park, which is like a buffer zone between the neighborhood and the big buildings. But then we heard that the workshop that because of the loading zone they can reconsider it. So I just want everybody to be aware it seems like 
at the moment it's on the table, we're not sure how it would go. So uh, it is something that uh, I, I think people should express where they stand. I feel very strongly that having the pocket park would be a huge plus for the development and also for the neighborhood. And the developer says they can control the loading, so I don't know if it's acceptable to the board, but I just want people to be aware it's on the table at the moment. Thank you, Borhead. All of this is really on the table. I mean, we've had four sessions already. The intention of all of this is to get written communication from all of the town planning people, all the departments, and our head planner, our Staff planning. assistant town manager, who is on top of this, along with Julie, um, who's not here this evening. Um, uh, all of this, all of this is being discussed. It's, it's not just at this meeting. It's being done every single day. Uh, there's something new coming in. There's a, there's a new request going out for more information. Uh, the development team keeps bringing stuff in. It's just that, when we do this, we have to do this in open session, and we want by the time, rather than going to each individual board meeting, which you don't need to do, that's the intent of the 40B. You get everybody assembled in one place, you take written statements, you take information in, you get feedback from in individuals, uh, not only in the neighborhood, but beyond the neighborhood, and then this board has to make a decision. What is, the, what is the best solution that we can get out of a 40B um, project? And that's where we're going. So um, I'd like to continue this, and if you want to make a statement about that green space, um, you certainly can do that. Um, May I just add something just very briefly? After. Just, just to point out, we'll defer to the board in terms of the topics of discussion tonight. Our entire team is here and, and ready and willing to answer any questions anybody has. If we don't get to everything during the hearing, we're not going anywhere afterwards. So. And we will be having another meeting. In fact, at the termination of this meeting this evening, we plan to figure out when is the next meeting. We're going to make it as soon as possible with information that's going to be presented. Go ahead. I live at 157 Green Street. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned the rotary, but I hadn't heard it in the three options discussed. I'm just wondering if it had been discussed at any point yet. And if not, um, I just moved from some of recently, and at the end of Broadway going into Davis Square, uh, where it connects with College Avenue, three other roads. They have a rotary that has um, pedestrian walkways all around and handles all five roads very well. So I think with Market Basket, Walker's Brook, Lakeview, Ter or Lakeview, and John Street, I think that would be less congested than what they have square currently. There's one neighbor who might be and also be impacted by the left hand, hand turns out of Market Street. Basket, which apparently you cannot do. Um, so I would just ask that that be considered. And then the other question would be, has anyone reached out to Google or Waze? Right now, I use Waze every day just because it tells me the fastest way, and depending on various traffic accidents. Um, and I think that if you were to propose it to them, that they would be open to the idea of if you limit certain turns or block certain roads, which roads they would be most likely to lead you down. So if you block off Lakeview, do you then have to go down Beach, down Green, and down John Street? So I think if you were to ask them, that you could probably get some detailed answers there. I don't know if you've ever had, had people in your industry ever reach out to the GPS providers for that information. And if not, could you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Slightly irrelevant <laughs> anecdote, it is relevant. Uh, my, my son had a problem with his username on, on Google, and, and I couldn't get a hold of anybody. It was either Google, they're very hard. I'm imagining, I'm imagining uh, it would take some help to find, to find a way of getting to Google. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> uh, in terms of your question about the rotary, we, as part of the peer review process, we just took a very preliminary look at whether or not a roundabout would fit at the Lakeville Avenue section, and uh, what our review was, it 
would probably take significant um, property impacts in order to make that happen. So we could put the vote down and found that it's probably not fair. Is that significant? How much space do you think? For a corridor like this, we're probably looking at at least 135 feet or so, plus sidewalks, uh, bicycle accommodations, if you want to provide that. So that has so a bicycle accommodation right now, though. So how's that different? Right. Uh, it's, it's something we have to look at. So in a very preliminary way to look at it, it just it basically will the whole intersection and potentially other uh, environmental impacts as well, next to general areas, all of uh, vegetation. So that's something that would also work um, one further look at. So based on that, we can find out the problem. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Diane. I live at 3 Smith Avenue. I don't have a question for any of you guys. I feel like the traffic thing will get solved in its time. I want to talk about trees um, and green. Um, because I've lived in Reading for almost 20 years, and a couple things are very concerning to me that, that haven't been addressed, but I'm sure engineers are talking about them. One is the flood history of that area and the fact that trees actually are really important when it comes to drainage. You take out one tree and you know that whole area, that wetlands, when you're proposing less green space, depending on the number of trees you're going to take down, you could actually oops, you could actually calculate for the impact that that would have on drainage. I'm sure you guys have plenty of people studying the flood plan, but I, you know, when you live there, anybody who walks by where that stream is can see it's very clear. We have a rainfall, we have an extended period of a few days, and that area, it's right up to the level of the street. So I'm concerned about the trees, not only for aesthetics and the green space, not only for aesthetics, but also for flood, for, you know, the preservation of green for our kids. That wetlands, another reminder just for all of you, there are lots of deer in that wetland, coyotes, tons of animal life, which I, I get it, you know, it, compared to, to having the project in 40B, I get that it's important to have a 40B project. And you can have both. I mean, all these things can be done on a scale that we can preserve the wetlands, the animal life, and even, you know, manage to, to do the traffic thing. Just one last thing, in relation to the traffic with a rotary, there's federal funding, state funding, federal funding sometimes available for these rotaries, so I, I don't know, you know, when you, when you talk about um, that you've examined it, not that I'm for a rotary, I think rotaries have a, a lot of headaches, actually, but, but the funding for rotaries doesn't necessarily have to only be you know, by Reading residents, you know, so just thank you. And I wanted to thank Brianna, the town, the developer for actually changing their plan and now coming up with this plan that's much more palatable for us. I mean, I think that's amazing. This is like such a landmark town where the town is actually working with the developer and the residents. So maybe we will actually be able to model for the state, you know, a new way of development. You know, so I think it's really critical that we publicize what's going on here, that we are really careful to, to take into account, John, I appreciate, you know, you, after each person speaks, I know you, you feel like, you know, you need to summarize, but we do understand about 40B. We've heard it every meeting that we come to also, so we know about the need for 40Bs. <laughs> I appreciate you reiterating that. But anyway, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Oriana. Thank you, everyone who lives in this neighborhood. And you guys, Chris, um, would you like to address where we are in conservation, why we haven't and we're not going, in essence, to this rate right, right now? Can you tell us where, where the development team is going? Sure. Thank you, for, uh, Mr. Chairman, again, for the record. Chris Sporadis, uh, registered professional engineer here in Massachusetts from the Engineering and Survey Office of Williams and Sporadis. We recently, as you know, submitted a revised plan set, and uh, the team felt it was important to get some feedback, uh, not only from the board um, at this meeting, uh, but from the, uh, the neighborhood and, uh, and from potentially another DRT meeting before we file with the Conservation Commission. 
We are required to file with the Conservation Commission because we are proposing work within 100 feet of a bordering vegetative wetland. And because we're proposing a project uh, of this nature uh, where um, it's a new development within 100 feet, we're required to comply with DEP's stormwater management regulations. And there are 10 standards. We've talked about them a little bit already. And uh, all of the things um, that, uh, that Diane mentioned uh, are interests of the Weapons Protection Act. And, uh, and our effort uh, in preparing our stormwater report, we have to show that we meet each of the 10 standards. The nice thing about those standards is that if we can prove that we meet them, um, we're, um, so the presumption is that we're protecting the interests of the act. And so we'll, our plan is to file soon with the Conservation Commission. That will be a separate public hearing process. Uh, folks that are abutters to the project will also get notice of the meeting, and uh, that'll be a separate, uh, separate public hearing. Thank you, sir. Are you, you've, no, you've already one been out. To finish up. Behind you. <laughs> Just to add one thing on, on the issue of trees before we leave that, that I believe was a comment of Gene at the last hearing, and um, we're committed to preserving as many trees as we can on the site and adding as many as we can, which is reasonable uh, within the space. So that's, that's a concern of ours as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Maria Servone, 116 John Street. And I just wanted to first thank everybody, um, as has, was someone said very eloquently, how um, important it is the thoughtfulness that's going into here, and that's really important to me. Um, I want to speak in support of the holistic approach that you're talking about. Um, I think that the problems with the traffic are um, complex. Um, you know, I didn't know about the Washington Street half, I know about the John Street half, but we're talking about a split of traffic onto two small roads that were not built for the traffic that they're bearing with a lot of old homes on them that are very close to the roads. And I can tell you from my own perspective in my house, which is very close to the Walker's Brook intersection, that the vibrations from the traffic in my house have caused cracks in the ceilings and stuff falls down in the basement all the time from the ceilings um, just from the traffic that's there now um, I'm not um, you know I, I, I think the 40b is an important thing and, and we need to we need to take care of this as you look at the traffic um, uh, evaluations that you're doing I read the whole report I read everything that you guys said um, one of the things that surprised me most was the statement about trucks, saying there was only one truck on the road on a, on a day which is just completely false. Um, and I know that you're looking at specific windows of time. I don't think that there were sufficient windows of time looked at. Um, but, um, uh, you know, the, do the work completely and right so that we get a good solution that looks at the whole area. That's my point. Thank you. No. Well, take a minute. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Barry, 57 Village. Um, I tend to agree that I think we should just build a thing and see what happens because uh, the worst thing you can do, from my experience, is change more than one thing at a time. And if you put in 80 cars and you change the intersection, you don't actually get to see what the difference is. So that's my opinion. Thank you, man. Good evening, uh, John Green, Six Light View. So I just, I had a bunch of ideas, but this is one that I was just thinking of. So when you guys put the video systems up, I actually saw them, because I take my dogs for a walk every morning at 4.30 in the morning, so it's usually not a lot of traffic during that time, but <laughs> I did notice them up, you know, on their little stanchions. Um, so I've been coaching baseball the last six years. I've been in writing for eight years, and um, it gets extremely busy, so taking that, if you take away that left turn, now traffic's going to be diverted back in the direction towards those baseball fields on you know, Eaton and uh, Pleasant Street, and that would be 
completely detrimental to that area because there are young kids that play in that area, and it's a it's a big you know it's a it's a family community, especially in that Smith Ave. You know, that, that whole district right there. And they're, like, they're not going to be mindful. And people aren't going to be mindful of them. So, you know, I, I don't think that would be even a, an option that should be considered. Um, and uh, the last thing, uh, someone mentioned, and I didn't want to beat a dead horse, but they were talking about how congested the traffic will be on the weekends. So I'm an electrician and I go, to Home Depot every other day. And on Saturdays, it's super, super busy going down Walker's Brook. And especially people coming in and out of that uh, Staples Center and the Market Basket, Stop and Shop, of course, it's, it's real busy. So um, I don't know. I don't, I don't think, I think the, the traffic light would probably be a much better idea if you can't do the rotary. The rotary would probably be optimal, but doing the, the traffic light, I would say secondarily, would probably be a much better option. Thank you, Jim. Uh, hi, uh, Dr. Neary, 155 Village Street. I'm the last house before market basket. Um, I know it's dated. My neighbor told me my dear to help me out. There was a traffic study done before they put the light in. Does anybody reference that? I think Gene might have been involved with this more. Um, there was a traffic study done. Uh, follows, I forget the name of the company. The guy's name, last name was Diaz. If memory serves me correctly, uh, at the time, this is just a tidbit. He, his conclusion, after all this traffic study, was, <laughs> They didn't need a traffic light at one jungle, at jungle Way. They gave it to Danis anyway because he wanted the entrance to the line of the basket. Okay. Just, I need to throw that out there because I can't get out of my driveway because he needed his big entrance. Okay. So obviously, I don't have the answer for what should go in there. I think I'm opposed to a rotary, but I just, I need access to my driveway. <laughs> And it's been colorful ever since that traffic light went in. And I'm, my concern is, and again, I'm being very self-centered here, but for, for me and the neighbors down the street, it's getting in and out. I mean, people don't let you out of the driveway. They'll pull up to a red light and they will stop and they'll look at you. So, again, I, I'm just I'm being self-centered. I wanted to bring up the fact that the traffic study was done a number of years ago. It, it was ignored in the traffic plan was put in against this recommendation. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Debbie Cotton, 124 John Street. I have a question for the engineers. Um, I live right on the bend that goes from John to um, Village. Uh, again, I'm another one that can't get out of their driveway. And the, um, one of the solutions was to turn the new traffic onto John Street. Would you close off that entrance to Village if you do the such a proposal? Okay, which uh, entrance of the village would that be? At the end of John, if you would extend Lakeview into John, would you close that off? So I think I think what you're asking is if, uh, if Lakeview gets diverted to John, would you shut off where Lakeview hits John now? No, would you shut off where John hits Village? Or the Pope? Uh, haven't, you know, haven't you because I can't get out of my driveway, so if people are coming from Lakeview, now through my, that way, and people coming from yeah. 129, to get to the center of town, I'd like to work almost every day. If I might respond, uh, that illustrates how, how important it is to look at me. Not to look at this uh, from a lot of different points of view, and then look at the effects on, on a lot of different people. Oh, I agree, but I know they haven't made a decision as to which of the three solutions they may temporarily implement um, until the global or the, the broader study is done. 
So I'm just going to put my input as far as a selection of one of those three options. Thank you, Susie. So I have a question for the board. My name is Joyce Gould. I live on John Street, 17 John Street. I'm one of the petition signers. Um, so I think it's already been mentioned that there's traffic controls in the neighborhood, but maybe they're not all really being followed. So I'd really like to hear what did the chief of police and people say about enforcing the current traffic controls so that we could understand better what's the real normal so that, again, we can see what would the impact be. So traffic controls and enforcing what we have, I guess, is really my question right now. Because up our end, we have the same problem this gentleman had wherever he went about that, even getting out of our own, our own driveways. Mm -hmm. um, I'd ask, we do have something from the fire chief. We do not have anything that I know of from the police chief. Me again. <laughs> Um, I think that, that what you're asking is, given the existing conditions, what, what, what is the town doing as far as enforcement of traffic laws? The existing traffic existing. Rules, speed limit, right. no turns, stop and, turns, all of it. Um, I, I don't have the answer for you tonight. I, um, I do sit monthly with uh, the chief, chief of police. Um, and other public safety professionals along with engineering and planning staff and others in the town and we go over every month in excruciating detail any complaints that are filed about traffic problems any um, emails that come in any feedback that they receive we go over it every month in a again a similar roundtable to the development review team it's a parking and traffic and transportation task force that we sit on so we discuss every month uh, and we have an agenda that changes every month uh, what the issues are out there I'm not aware that, that there's a, a problem. I don't, I've, I've gone to almost every meeting for the last nine years, and I don't remember this ever coming up as, as, a, as a, a, a thing that has been filed with the police department. So if there are existing concerns, I would encourage you, they're open 24-7. Um, you can email them, you can call them, you can call the chief's office, you can go onto the town website, see click fix, if you don't want to talk to a person, you can file it electronically, and um, the town will will follow up. Thanks, Jean. Hi. Um. Gina DeLong, 115 Eaton Street. Um, I also had a question um, as far as following laws, things like that, um, with the speed limit in specifically. Um, I actually did do the C-click fix, never got a response at all. Uh, just wanted to know that. Um, the speed limit unposted is 30 miles an hour, and anyone that drives to that neighborhood knows that that's ridiculously fast. Again, I don't know who this is supposed to be posed to. But um, I was wondering if there was any way we could propose to lower that speed limit. Um, I myself go 15, 20 at the most, because 20 feels too fast, honestly. Um, so with the addition of more cars in the neighborhood, I just feel like with all the kids, I mean, even just people walking around, walking their dogs, taking a walk, taking a jog, I feel like that speed limit is way too fast for that congested area. So I was wondering if that could be something that we could look into. Um, also probably way out there, but speed bumps maybe, just to slow the neighborhood down a little bit um, just for traffic and safety concerns, especially around the playground. Like we already had speed bumps. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is John Burson. Um, I'm on Ruben Street in Redding for about 40 years. Uh, just made a couple notes. I just kind of got wind of this meeting at the last minute because all these other similar projects. I've been doing 40 projects for a number of years myself. 
I agree with it. I think it's great that Reading's moving forward to meet the threshold of meeting all the 40 Bs. I wish they could build 500 units of 40 Bs. Affordable housing is good. However, the downside of this site, I just feel that it's inappropriate because the location of the road, the traffic right there. I just, I, I look at properties all over Massachusetts, and these are one of the things that I think, um, I think the, you know, for the public safety, um, the concerns of the project, for the traffic coming onto Washington Street, I don't think it's gonna happen. Because if I'm looking at a project to develop and get involved in, that's one of the first things I'd be ruling out before, you know, going into the 40 d and doing all that, is the traffic studies and safeties. You know, yeah, you can make the road wider and all that. I just can't see all the traffic lights right there and then doing that, um, I guess, John Street area. You know, whatever they have to ship, the neighbors don't like. I'm sorry that it happens, it's going to come in, but I think the impact of the cars coming into Washington Street is going to be a major problem. And I think that's, you know, I've seen this town screw up a lot of things over the years. Thank you. I'm sorry. You know, hey, Linfield, that was a great project. We blew it. We had that project right in our back pocket when they, when they went right, my engineer went right to Linfield when it was done. So we lost a lot of money there. This project we need to satisfy for me. I just traffic. It's not going to happen. I, I'm just telling you right now. So first one to call it. Anyone else? Uh, Alex Trout, one zero four Pleasant Street. Uh, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> I think we're maybe avoiding a unicorn in the room here is that we have an artery that goes directly from this development to Walker's Book Drive, and it's right here. And you might be thinking to yourself, hey, this is a private property. It's maybe 20 feet above grade. But um, if you brainstorm, you can come up with um, eminent domain, you can come up with uh, uh, agreements uh, in the 20 foot I mean we're Americans we can conquer I, I, I don't know why that has been mentioned it has can I respond to that yep I'm back um, we actually had a lot of discussion about that and um, it's actually in the state's approval letter that uh, the state acknowledged that the town has flagged that proximity of that commercial area next door as having some potential and asked that the developer consider that. Um, we've talked about a flyover pedestrian bridge. It's all in the notes, it's all online. We've gone over it and over it and over it. Um, in the end, you can only imagine what the cost of that would be. And as one major component of this process that we are forced to comply with because of the state law, Mass General Law Chapter 40B, we have to be mindful of pushing too far and asking for things that make this project uneconomical. At that point, we lose all our leverage. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Hearing uh, no other high input this evening, we still do have some business to take care of. Um, we have um, I'm not going to I'm not going to go over the list of proposed waivers that were submitted uh, just recently only because they only apply to what is existing as of the time that this new uh, product, the new adjustments and new proposal came forward. That could change over time. But we do need to have a lot of that in front of us, or the board has to have that in front of us, so that as it comes down the pike, we can keep track of that all. And again, town staff, is working towards that also to keep us in line. Again, the board. Um, 
So I'm going to pass on that one. Um, we do have something um, on the uh, draft engineering peer review. Uh, Gene, you can come back again. <laughs> you guys are going to get sick of me. Yes. Okay, um, so we have prepared a draft uh, engineering, and this is civil engineering. We're shifting gears from traffic to talk about civil engineering, storm water, and the like, uh, which is another peer review consultant. In the past, we've used niche engineering for those of you who have attended other 40B public hearings and that's likely to be who we would um, try and hire for this peer review. We came up with a draft scope, and the applicant um, did a very handy job of redlining that scope. And uh, so now I think it's up to, up for discussion um, on the redline version that's before the board and how we're going to um, come to some agreement on this scope so that we can move forward and hire the uh, engineering peer review consultant. Thank you, Jane. So I'll let Chris discuss the, the specifics of the red line. But what I think our intent was in, in the proposed changes that we made to the, the town scope was to bring the, the, the scope of the peer review more in line with the traditional peer review in terms of assessing the, the work that Chris has done from the stormwater point of view and eliminating the, the more extraneous issues such as consideration of low impact development, which is really more of a, that's a choice that the developer would make. You know, and this is something that Chris can go into, but these are options that we've considered. Uh, that things like that aren't really appropriate in our, in our opinion for a peer review, which is more of an assessment of whether Chris's work is up to a snuff from the engineering standpoint. Uh, one other thing that I would note, going back again to the DRT meeting, the development review team meeting that we're having in October, our hope is that that meeting will help us to narrow some of the issues in terms of what's needed from an engineering standpoint, because we'll be there with the DPW, we'll be there with the town engineer, uh, the entire town staff, hopefully, uh, who will have input to get to us in terms of what needs to change. Let's uh, turn it over to Chris, though, to, to, uh, to go over what we've done with our design. Okay, uh, thank you. So <clears throat> we took a look at the uh, draft scope of services for peer review of civil engineering. And as, uh, as Jesse mentioned, we, uh, we ran through the document and identified certain areas that we felt didn't, didn't apply to a, a review of civil engineering plans associated with the 40B project. Uh, we, we understand that uh, the set of plans that we prepared uh, deal with, uh, with stormwater, uh, sewer, and water. Uh, and from a storm, uh, stormwater standpoint, our charge is to make sure that our plan complies with those 10 uh, DEP stormwater management standards that I mentioned before. Uh, this is also going to be something that's going to be reviewed by the Conservation Commission. Uh, last meeting, I, uh, I also mentioned the fact that uh, normally uh, subdivision, or such a subdivision or other similar type project, uh, the town engineer um, uh, here in town normally reviews uh, stormwater reports and we've got a, a, a good uh, track record uh, with the town uh, with plans that we design and submit. Uh, after all, um, the person who designs the project uh, is uh, the person who stamp and signature and on the plan takes the responsibility for that design. Uh, the peer reviewer, in my opinion, uh, their job should be to take those plans and determine whether or not they're in compliance with standard engineering practice. Uh, these days we find that uh, peer review scopes of work can get a little bit out of control, uh, meaning that uh, we find sometimes that uh, peer reviewers uh, we'll start redesigning the project, and there have been uh, cases on, on more than one occasion that peer review uh, costs uh, have sometimes exceeded um, our costs of designing the plan. And uh, those are the types of things that we're trying to uh, control. And we understand that uh, the town would like to peer review our, our plans and our designs, and we don't have a problem with that. Um, and that was sort of uh, the approach that, that I took when I looked through the the scope to try to limit, um, limit the scope to um, 
really the, the plan set and our drainage design, specifically as it relates to compliance with DEP stormwater uh, management regulations and the stormwater handbook. So Mr. Chair, would you like me to identify some of the things that I struck out to um, uh, to explain to you a little bit more in detail about why we struck certain sections? Um, the board just received this this evening, so um, oh, okay. um, I'm, yeah. that's just my quick well, overview. Uh, that that would be great. Yeah, that would be great, Chris. Okay. So in the first paragraph, uh, we struck uh, the sentence that talked about uh, compliance with local regulations um, uh, because uh, really, the, the, in terms of local regulations. Uh, we are subject to the stormwater management standards and regulations, uh, and, uh, and those are state regulations that are administered by the um, by the Conservation Commission, uh, being the representative of the town and uh, being responsible for administering um, the Wetlands Protection Act and its regulations. Uh, so uh, we felt that that wasn't necessary. At the end of that first paragraph, we, we struck the word wetlands uh, because um, we have already uh, flagged the wetland resources on the property. Uh, the wetland resources uh, have been reviewed and approved by the Conservation Commission as part of the public hearing process uh, for which we received a, um, a permit called uh, an order of resource area delineation. Uh, so we felt that that's not necessary to revisit wetlands. Uh, moving on to the next paragraph, uh, we struck out a section that talked about assessment of environmental conditions uh, within the project. Uh, those are uh, under the purview of, um, of a different set of regulations altogether uh, that have um, little to do with uh, civil engineering. They have to do with hazardous waste and uh, hazardous waste uh, cleanup and management. Um, that's the subject of, uh, of a report that's commonly referred to as a 21E report. An environmental site assessment is another word for that. Uh, that's, that's usually done under a different set of uh, regulations uh, under, the, under the guidance and um, uh, review of, of someone called a licensed site professional. Uh, the applicant, our client, um, has already procured such a, uh, such a report, and that report has already been submitted, um, and it doesn't really have to do with um, uh, the stormwater, uh, the stormwater, if you will. We added a sentence at the end of the second paragraph uh, that talks about what the basis of the review should be, and that it should be based on the 2008 Massachusetts Stormwater Handbook, which is the handbook that DEP uh, calls out in their regulations, in general, uh, application of accepted industry standards. Uh, it was really just simplifying uh, the next paragraph, which is from two, three, paragraph three. Um, a portion of that did mention the 2008 Massachusetts Stormwater Handbook, uh, but some of those other um, uh, regulations, if you will, uh, don't apply uh, to, this, uh, to this project. One, two, three, four, the fourth paragraph. Uh, had to do with the consultant conferring with town planning and conservation staff and town department heads in order to determine compliance with applicable town bylaws and state regulations. Once again, um, any peer review engineer understands and knows um, that uh, the, the normal standard operating procedure is to take a set of civil engineering plans and review them uh, using uh, DP stormwater management regulations and the 10 standards. Uh, so uh, talking about uh, those things and expanding the scope is, is one, of thing, one of the things that we were trying to learn. So you'll notice that we struck out things like town bylaws uh, and uh, again environmental assessments and conditions of the project impacts on the wetlands uh, because they are uh, not applicable under the under the regulations that uh, that were referred to, and that uh, continues in the uh, in the review of the bullet statements at the bottom of page one. On the second page. I heard Jesse mention uh, low impact development techniques uh, and assessing the feasibility of the low impact uh, development features. Uh, I think everyone understands uh, that 
we are um, limited with the amount of land that, that we have to work with, and sometimes our options for what we refer to as best management practices, which are the types of stormwater management devices that we uh, that we choose for a particular project, um, are limited. And oftentimes, when we are designing apartment buildings on smaller on smaller lots, uh, where uh, much of the land is covered by um, by building landscaping and uh, parking, uh, our our uh, choices are limited to usually uh, best management practices, we call them BMPs, that are underground to try to maximize the amount of space. Uh, we come up with a design uh, that includes a, a, a good treatment chain uh, and using underground infiltration um, galleries serve the same purpose as an above ground uh, feature. Sometimes, um, and we've had recent success uh, with this in the, uh, in the town of Middleton, uh, we try to incorporate, uh, to the best of our ability, uh, low impact development techniques. We recently um, proposed a subdivision, uh, which is a relatively small subdivision, so it was a good case study of four lots in Middleton where we asked the planning board to waive almost all of their local uh, subdivision rules and regulations and allow us to do a project uh, that was completely low impact development where we eliminated curbing, we eliminated sidewalks, um, and uh, treated stormwater in a, in a series of swales that would just run off the road uh, to a couple of rain gardens. We had more land to work with. And so we do look at using low impact development techniques on every project as we're considering you know, what we have to work with. We heard early on uh, in our preliminary DRT meetings, we've gone to several DRT, some of them even before we filed, uh, that one of the most important things uh, to uh, the Conservation Commission and their representatives was making sure that they really wanted us to honor the 25-foot zone of natural vegetation, which is something um, commonly referred to as a no-disturb zone. No-disturb zones are not part of the Wetlands Protection Act and its regulations. Uh, and so oftentimes when a town does not have a local bylaw, we have the ability um, as long as our project meets the DEP stormwater management standards to go closer with our activities than 25 feet. Uh, but we have really tried hard to honor the 25 foot zone of natural vegetation uh, from the very beginning um, through all of our iterations. And we've also honored the uh, 50 foot no build zone, which is another local requirement, something that we didn't necessarily have to do, but again, it was something that was that kept coming back over and over again, and so we did incorporate that into the project. So if you take a 25-foot setback, 50-foot uh, setback to buildings on um, relatively small lots, it, it leaves us with even less room to work with. So that's another reason why we couldn't uh, propose uh, some low-impact uh, low development techniques on this particular project. Testing and analysis, uh, recommendation for testing and analysis, that's really, a, a, in my opinion, associated with environmental uh, concerns associated with, with hazardous waste and uh, contamination. And the 20-way report for this project, uh, I believe, uh, gives, our, gives the, pro the, pro the property a clean bill of health. And that's not appropriate uh, typically for, um, uh, the, you know, as part of a stormwater management design. We did, and I think I went into this in quite a bit of detail, a, 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 a number of deep test holes were excavated throughout the site uh, to uh, determine what the texture of the soil is and to determine estimated seasonal high groundwater, uh, which are elements that we need to know uh, when we're approaching a design like this. Uh, and so um, you know, we provided that uh, testing and analysis in each of our stormwater management areas. Uh, so that's why that was stricken. Uh, there was another task uh, on the second page, second paragraph, a task H on the review and response of concerns received by staffers EPA as well as those outlined in the letter referenced in the neighborhood response to Eaton uh, Lakeview Apartments. Uh, we, again, wanted to limit the scope. Um, uh, we've already uh, gone through the, um, uh, the neighborhood re uh, response and the neighborhood comment letter uh, related to the development, uh, part of which had, had to do with um, our engineering design plans, and we didn't want to have to revisit that again. Uh, the next paragraph, which is paragraph three on page two, 
consultant will confer with town staff again uh, to gain an understanding of any specific concerns the town may have. Uh, the town will draft an initial uh, memorandum of understanding and summarize findings and if needed recommendations to address um, issues. Typically, um, peer reviews, uh, you know, go something like this, and we just went through one with, um, uh, with traffic. Uh, the peer review uh, consultant will take our plans and our drainage report, they'll go through it, and then they'll, they'll come up with a comment letter. Um, a lot of them are technical, um, technical issues, and, uh, you know, typically uh, uh, the findings will be uh, reviewed with, um, with town staff before they issue the report. And then the report is issued, and then we respond to those um, to those comments. Uh, in terms of the meetings, uh, we recommend limiting um, limiting the uh, consultant to, to attending uh, one ZBA public hearing. And we felt that it wasn't necessary uh, to have them come in a, in a, in a appear in front of the conservation commission. It's a separate public hearing process. Uh, and again, um, I'm going to reiterate it again that. Um, the stormwater management design is relatively simple. Uh, it's a typical um, catch basin water quality inlet, underground infiltration, things that uh, the town engineer sees it sees very often. And it's, uh, and in my opinion, it would be very simple uh, to uh, to have this reviewed uh, locally by staff. And again, uh, on page three, uh, we struck the um, uh, number of means. Um, because uh, you know, we believe that, um, that the review should be pretty straightforward and that um, if something were to come up you know, and, and we, we would need another meeting, you know, of course, you know, we're open to those suggestions. So that summarizes uh, some of my thought process as we went through the uh, peer review scope, again, trying to limit, limit the scope. Thank you, Chris. Gene, your staff. Chris. Uh, Gene and I <laughs> discussed this together and uh, agreed that I'd, I'd respond uh, before, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, a couple thoughts in response uh, to the redlining of the, of the uh, scope. Um, I think several of the points are completely well taken, um, and a couple others I would quibble with a little bit. Um, one of the comments that I think we heard a couple times from the applicant uh, is they struck in several places that the peer reviewer would review uh, compliance with town bylaws. Um, and I think that is, to some extent, a fair point. Uh, we don't, under 40B, the applicant doesn't necessarily need to comply with all of our town bylaws, so we don't need the peer reviewer to sort of run down the list and say they comply with this or they don't comply with that. That's the reason why they give us the waiver list. They've identified the things that they don't comply with, so we don't need the peer reviewer to um, you know, effectively double check that. Where I disagree slightly, though, is that it is important to where the applicant has requested a waiver of a town bylaw. Uh, it's important for us, for the peer reviewer, I think, to discuss not whether they comply with it, because again, they've asked for a waiver, but to discuss whether or not uh, there are going to be impacts if that waiver is granted that will cause problems with this project or the surrounding area. So what I think is important is any time that they've asked for a waiver that we have, that we do indeed have the peer reviewer um, look at it and assess whether or not the grant of that waiver by this board will have any negative impacts that you might not in normally anticipate. So uh, I think the good example there is that um, they have struck a couple places uh, a review of the town's uh, wetlands uh, by law. Um, and again, I don't know that we need the peer to say whether they comply or they don't with the town's wetlands by law. But I think it is important to have them take sort of a more global look um, and comment on the requested waiver of the town's wellness protection by law and say whether or not uh, the site will function properly if you grant those waivers. Um, the other thing, general comment, is we certainly don't want the peer reviewer that we hire to re-engineer or redesign uh, the project for the applicant. But to the extent when the peer reviewer is conducting their review, they see things that might be improved upon. Um, 
were added to this to the project, I do think it's uh, important and relatively common for the peer reviewer to suggest um, certain improvements to the plan. Um, I, and another example is um, Chris outlined for you now, just now all of the sort of thoughtful uh, things he did when he was designing this site and um, explained why, in his opinion, LID wouldn't work for the site. Uh, and I expect that a peer reviewer engineer is likely to agree with much of what he's done and that maybe LID is inappropriate. But it's helpful when you have a single engineer making representations to the board, like Chris just did, uh, to have a peer review engineer look at it and say that they agree or they disagree, because that's the way this normally works. So again, I, I don't want to suggest that we're going to have a peer review or redesign or re-engineer the project, just to point out that it's, it's I think, useful for both the board and for the applicant to have a peer reviewer look at this stuff. and. Um, issue an initial round of comments, then work with the applicant, and usually, ultimately, uh, issue uh, a letter uh, after a couple changes have been made, uh, signing off on the project. And then you can uh, act with confidence um, with respect to the engineering of the project. Um, the only other thing I'd add is, uh, in terms of having the peer reviewer consultant confer with town staff, um, I think that's relatively uh, common. I think sometimes it is useful to have staff work with the peer reviewer um, to look at the report before it goes final and issue to the board, just to look at it and to, you know, hopefully um, determine if there's any questions that weren't answered or that would be useful to have the board uh, have answered for the board um, before the report goes final and is issued to you. So I think Again, I, I don't. I went on at length there, and that may seem like there's more disagreement between me and the applicant than, than there actually is. I think a couple of points are are, are well taken, um, but I think some of this stuff um, ought to go back in um, before we before we bring the bring the reviewer back online. Um, and I don't know if we want to hash that out tonight, or if um, uh, you, the board wants to instruct me uh, and staff to work with the applicant uh, to get this finalized. It is certainly important that we get this uh, completed and out very quickly. Um, but I think, and I, I, I have to say, I think once a, once any peer reviewer engineer gets working, um, you know, a lot of the stuff is I think likely to just sort of. Uh, it's easy to, to disagree about the finer point of the scope um, when we're sitting here uh, looking at this document. I think once a peer reviewer engineer gets working um, and start keep, you know, is, is engaged by the board and is working with the applicant civil engineer, uh, a lot of this stuff I think is likely to, a lot of the disputes that we're talking about now are likely to just sort of fall away as the process gets underway. Okay. Um, I'll ask the, the board itself. Um, what your thoughts are on having town council and the staff uh, review the scope um, before it gets actually set up. Because we, that's a vote we need probably to take tonight if we can. And if not, uh, we need to get it done ASAP, otherwise we're gonna fall behind. Right. So Robert, you wanna go first? Sure. Uh, I, I certainly think, uh, and I think we depend as a board on the daytime government to, to work with the uh, applicant on this mm -hmm. uh, and develop the scope. And it's something that we're gonna be not meeting every month, uh, gonna be able to uh, hurry this along. I think that's up to daytime government. And I, I think that's what we, we depend on them to uh, work with the developer on that and uh, to expedite this uh, this whole thing. What I would say is, and, and I guess this is more more to Chris in, in questions, is when you do, because we are talking the civil engineering peer review here, uh, that you do submit a complete package here. Now, when we got the new plans, and granted they were new plans uh, for the July meeting, which was a whole rebuild, you might say, of the site and a reduction of units, et cetera, 
they did not appear at that time that they would be ready for a peer review. I would suspect now that uh, you maybe progressed along, uh, you have got your uh, piping systems, drainage, water, uh, sanitary, uh, you, I don't know if you've done calculations yet, but this is what I would expect that would be supplied to the peer reviewer is calculations to that effect in sizing of pipes, uh, et cetera, and working with the town engineer on that too. Because ultimately, I think we depend on the town engineer to give an overall approval of the, the uh, civil engineering aspect of the project. And uh, so that, that's what I would expect. That, and, and I don't know how far along you are on that, Chris, if you are ready for a peer review, or is, this, is that a month down the line, or what? Is it okay to answer? Sure. Yeah, so uh, every plan set that we've submitted, uh, starting with the first comprehensive permit submittal, uh, was a complete engineering package, ready to build. Uh, full engineering calculations, full stormwater report, um, all the way right through, right through um, drainage design, uh, sewer, water, uh, drainage, uh, layout, proposed grading, uh, heights and, and locations of walls. Um, so that obviously has been revised most recently right. back in July, but it's a complete set. It can be handed to a contractor tomorrow to build. And so, uh, you know, it's definitely ready for peer so review. So you're, you're basically ready right now for peer review at any time for That's the right. engineer. Okay, sounds good. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, some of the comments the council made, I thought I, I totally agree with uh, comments to your comments, <laughs> but uh, I, I can see where we could eliminate uh, the uh, town regulations from this peer review, uh, uh, but uh, you know. I think the, imp the impact uh, on the waiver requests that you're including in here should be reviewed as part of this peer assessment. And uh, I uh, think the town engineering ought to put the stamp of approval on whatever changes should be made to this statement of work. And we ought to get it out of ASAP, as I say, February is coming. Uh, we've got to get this stuff going. Eric. Is, yeah, um, <clears throat> so I fully support giving um, Chris and Gene, uh, uh, delegating to them the scope of it. Um, just as a speaking as a board member, I find the, the peer reviews incredibly helpful. This is not my background. Um, of course, you know you're you're an applicant. You're looking to do something. So, uh, in that respect, you're in an advocacy role. You want something to occur. And so, uh, with the peer review, we have a not that you have any you know nefarious bias or anything like that, but we have a uh, a separate and neutral um, peer reviewer to, to you know give it a second a second look. Um, I agree with the comments that the town council has raised in terms of you know the, the issues that are, are going to come up. As you pointed out, I guess in your opinion, it's a, a fairly routine um, and simple project. So I wouldn't expect that the expense would be exorbitant to you know just confirm that, which is I think what I would be looking for. Um, and like I said, whatever whatever the town is looking for is what I, I think would probably be appropriate for the scope. Nick. Great. Um, I just want to say I appreciate you going through the red line version of you know what what you took out and why you took it out, and I agree there was some redundancy. I agree you're not an LSB. You shouldn't be doing the environmental assessment. It's already been done anyways, and shouldn't be part of the scope. And I concur with the other board members that yeah, I'd like to see data government revise the scope and um, incorporate some of Chris's comments about making sure what was taken out was valid. If there's a valid reason for that, because we're not experts, so that's all. Thank you. Um, I concur also. Um, we depend totally on our staff um, here. 
Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have the expertise to try to put this whole package together. So um, I would accept the motion at this point um, to uh, permit uh, staff along with uh, town council to uh, redo the or to review the scope uh, and finalize it ASAP um, giving them the permission to do so um, can I suggest a go ahead. so I guess what I'd suggest and I could style this as a motion if it's um, um, if that would work I would I would have the board vote to instruct myself and Jean to uh, work over the next several days with the applicant to uh, attempt to come up with a agreed scope of services consistent with the comments uh, that the board has expressed tonight. Uh, but in addition, and in any event, to require the applicant to deposit sufficient funds in the board's 53G account to fund a civil engineering peer review from niche engineering. Um, and then again, I'd suggest that that also come with the expectation that that civil engineering peer review report would be ready uh, for presentation to the board at your next meeting, whenever we, uh, whatever date uh, that happens to occur on. Okay. Do I hear a motion to? I'll uh, I'll move on uh, Chris's statement there. Make a motion. Do hear a second? Second. Any discussion? No discussion. All in favor? Four zero zero. Um, that takes care of that issue. Um, along with that, we have, um, I think, four or five other um, letters or uh, comments. I'm not going to read them all into the record, but they will be part of the record. Um, I believe G posted them on the town website. And I think they, they already have been posted, yes. but um, being every, everything is online in the first place. So anything that you that anybody has sent in <coughs> in terms of whether they're here or not, it's gets it's posted. Um, you can go on the Wit Town website anytime and post and see all of that. So I'm not gonna go over and read all of them. Uh, but I will say that the, I think that there's five additional ones that were sent in um, over the uh, past two, two weeks. Well, actually more so last week and a half. Um, other issues before the board. Um, of course, the, the last thing we want to do is to settle on an upcoming date. Um, am I forgetting anything, Jane? Um, it, the only the only other thing that we uh, the only other thing that we talked about, and I don't know if we're ready to get into this tonight, is whether or not there needs to be, or the board would like to see anything on the architectural peer review, or whether there are a few remnant components of what was at one point envisioned to be in the architectural peer review that could be folded into the. Um, civil engineering peer review so that we would um, option one would be to direct staff to work on a scope for the architectural which we have a draft option two would be to um, omit an architectural peer review because of all the work that's been done to date but have a few of the I'll call them remnant components added in to the civil engineering peer review, things like landscaping and some of the other things that we've been talking about, um, to ha as Chris states, to have a, a professional, unbiased third party look at a couple of things that are probably still hanging out there. Um, again, we're, we're putting an awful lot of pressure on you to get this stuff out. It's part of the scope that needs to be um, addressed and adjusted. Um, right now, I mean, it, I think from the study group, 
Uh, it was clear that a lot of the architectural, not redesigning each and every unit within the buildings, not the colors um, that, that used on the exterior versus the interior, location of um, some issues. I mean, we talked about uh, elevators and, and other things. If, if, if maybe we could have a list of those, I don't know how the board feels about this, but maybe a list of those remnant things would be appropriate. We could take that up for the next next meeting. Um, or, huh? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Griffin, um, representing uh, uh, Curtis D. Benetto, our vets. Um, as discussed uh, before, and, and having done projects like this before, um, the original scope that was presented, um, again, you can you can say color, you can say design-wise. We have gone extensive, um, you know, um, design reviews with uh, the neighborhood committee, and we've settled on a scope of size, um, color, uh, sort of the style of the buildings. Um, that's subjective. That's that's typically not what um, these projects get reviewed as uh, in general. Um, typically, they, an architectural review will be limited to: Does it meet code? Does it meet accessibility access? Um, are there, you know, sufficient um, ramps to the building? Are there specific, the doors the correct size? Um, are there the correct number of units that are two A versus one A, one, uh, you, uh, group one units? Those type of physical uh, things. There has been requests already with meeting with the fire department about location of fire department connections, mm -hmm. uh, fire um, uh, fire rooms um, with the with pumps. Uh, so as we go through, th those would be the type of things that we would expect to see. Um, some generals, is, it goes back to what Chris was saying, is, is sort of the general code. Do we meet code, which we have to adhere to by our standards anyway and by the stamp that we put on it and our uh, supervision of the construction? So, you know, we're, we're bound by that anyway, but having a second opinion on, on those type of issues what we would expect to see. Uh, we wouldn't expect to see stuff on, on going re rehashing um, design issues. Okay, I know Chris has. Uh, I just had I just had a very uh, quick comment in, in in addition to what Gene said earlier, uh, and that is I just wanted to remind the board um, that in in all of its comprehensive permit decisions, um, the board requires as a condition that the applicant, uh, well, that the town hire a building code consultant and a fire code consultant uh, before the a building permit can issue. So there is, there's necessarily a certain amount of um, architectural and code review that will happen uh, after after a comprehensive permit gets issued. So there's some architectural stuff that happens um, later on down the road. And just a, a general observation from other 4 d projects that I've worked on, um, and with the caveat that you know whether to hire an architectural consultant or not is, is up to the board, uh, not to me. But one co one observation is that an architectural peer review is often a useful exercise when you have an applicant uh, who comes in and is immediately unwilling to agree to any revisions to its project and sort of takes the position that you know this is the project and um, take it or leave it. Or leave it. Mm. When, when you've got one of those, the architectural peer review can be a useful tool to uh, you know exert some changes on the project. Um, it's, it's a, we're in a little bit of an unusual situation here where the project underwent a substantial redesign in the proposal um, so early in the process. Um, so I just wanted to sort of you know, it's, it's possible that an architectural peer review might be more commonly used in that first scenario rather than the second. So what would your recommendation be then, Chris, to the board? Uh, I think, I, I guess, I think it's absolutely imperative that we get going on civil engineering right away. Um, I think the niche is probably perfectly capable of providing some additional peer review comment um, with respect to things like landscaping and lighting that might also have bled over into what an architect might have looked at if we were doing that right now. Um, I think in order to get going immediately on the uh, stuff that you always review uh, on a 4D project, I guess I might suggest that we get going with niche on the civil engineering with some of those other points that Gene was suggesting, like landscaping and lighting, and uh, you know, 
and it's entirely up to the board, but I think it's it's possible that architectural uh, could wait until at least at least wait until um, a later point once we get the civil engineering all done. But again, I don't want to I don't want to take away the decision uh, that is ultimately one of the board. So we would just expand the civil aspect of it with with uh, recommendations on uh, the, the two items, the, the landscaping and, and some of the other lighting, lighting, some of the other aspects that are related specifically uh, that he could handle, that would, or they could handle. I think that would be used, sufficient progress for between now and the next meeting, at least. Okay. Do we want to amend the previous motion then? To I think we can add it, but if, if if I had a question, uh, can we expect then that at the next meeting we would have a uh, a draft? You might say of an architectural peer review that you would be looking for in this and what I'm getting at in that particular case it sounds like it may be just an overview a peer review of the buildings etc on that and it wouldn't be that extensive then I, I guess what I was suggesting is that is that um, what we have right now is I think a scope for architectural peer review um, that, that, that Gene uh, prepared. And I guess what I understand is there's also an objection from the applicant to actually going forward with that fully. Mm -hmm. now. Fully, right. So I guess if we pursue the approach that I outlined, we would move ahead, we would move full speed ahead with civil engineering peer, peer review. Um, and expect to have that ready for presentation to the board at your next meeting. Uh, but we would not have um, an architect lined up or ready to go if we do what I just, just described. Can I, uh, can I, may I ask, um, go ahead. You, you did mention that you, the town requires um, uh, other other reviews, i.e. Uh, accessibility and um, what was the other one? Building. A, 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 yeah, general building. Um, so wouldn't that fall under the same scope that an architectural review would provide? That would be my assessment. Yes or no? Because that's typically what, we, what I have encountered in my career. So. I think the difference um, doing it now as opposed to later is that if you do it later, your project is effectively final. And, and you have um, a consultant reviewing your construction plans for code compliance as opposed to um, offering comments for, for the board in terms of how the project might be revised before it's actually approved. Okay. And again, assuming that we meet with appropriate fire, police, and everything else, typically those are the type of things that you can't actually review until those meetings happen. And by the time those happen, you are at a stage where most of the things are, are vetted at that point. And because it's also controlled construction, we as architects and engineers and civil engineers have to sign off and are held to that standard. So I would think that that's typically what I've encountered is the review is, okay, have you met those standards and are we, again, up to those standards that we are held to by the state and our licenses? Um, and anything earlier beyond that is, is comments that are taken into effect as, as we have in any process. So I guess the question is, is what is that scope that we are trying to define that would, would be appropriate um, but if you have all these other people lined up that are going to essentially do the same thing, it, it, I think it's. I, I think we're doubling up. That's the only question. We'll and, and currently, I'm not suggesting that we we double up. But the but the, the difference is that at this stage in the application process, we don't have construction level drawings to actually review. Um, so it's and. So, so those are the ones that, that would be reviewed under the conditions that I mentioned in the decision prior to issuance of a building permit. Right, but essentially the, the architectural peer review, depending on what the scope is outside of code-related issues, um, um, I guess would, would you have to wait for those that sort of development of plans to get to that point or into a general design development point? It doesn't have to be construction documents, but going from schematics, which we are right now, to the next phase, which incorporates comments from all of the, you know, site lighting, um, 
you know, you know, fire department, police department, and any other uh, engineering requirements for the project um, would get us to that level that is slightly below the final, but would then be appropriate for the, you know, for the review. Um, but then at the same time, then you are essentially reviewing code issues. I just don't want to have to go, because essentially if you, if you do that review early and then you go back two months later and do a review, pay someone else to do a review again, you're reviewing the same issues, which had been resolved earlier. So I think you, you can have it accomplished in one, in one fell swoop. That would be our, you know, intention. I don't know that I necessarily agree, but I don't know that we need to argue about it. Okay. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the scope we need to be seen. I guess I guess the point. Can, can I make a suggestion, Chris? Uh, my suggestion would be that we put a pin back in the architectural review discussion as we did at the workshop and leave that to be decided between us and, and perhaps there are some aspects of engineering and architecture that can overlap and we can agree on that and leave the, the issues to be ironed out in terms of how can this project be made better from an architectural perspective, not that I'm suggesting your plan can be improved in any way, uh, <laughs> leave that to the DRT meeting because as multiple members of the board have said tonight, you rely heavily on daytime government, so do we. The DRT meeting is absolutely essential to us and frankly, probably more helpful to us than a peer review from an architect who will be looking at the plan for the first time. We, we want to get the input from the DPW, and the town engineer about what they think will make this project better for the neighborhood of the town. Well, uh, my question to uh, Gene and Chris, as well as as well as the team, um, is that it really is dependent somewhat on uh, what we are looking for as our next meeting, and we're somewhat limited to the dates that we have. If we move something too close in time, are we going to be able to get everything done? So I'm looking at the dates, and I look at October 17th as being available, and November 7th. Um, in which case, um, if we put too much pressure on... Look, looking at the dates that have been identified as the you know, best candidates for our upcoming meeting, the first one on the, on the list is October 17th. 17th. Uh, I, I think... I'm reasonably confident that if we get Edge hired in the next several days, that they could be ready to present the report to you on October 17th. And then what, what, what I was getting at, at that time at the October 17th meeting then, if that's when we're going to hear the engineering, will we have a scope for the architectural then to, to take a look at, at that particular item? That's what I was getting. And, and I know that may take the applicant in daytime government to get together and uh, maybe formulate a, exactly. uh, uh, an updated scope on that. But I would like to see that on October 17th too. That would help speed the process forward and also. Then, then we, whether we vote on that or we have to wait till the next meeting or not, but we'd have that, but it would be nice to even vote on it that night. Well, the intention, I think, for yeah. the board would be to vote on it that night, night too, so, we, so we continue the movement aspect of it. Otherwise, as I keep saying, February is coming very quickly. Right. Um, so we don't want to wait too well, long. To, to, to vote on them, to, to vote on daytime government, to proceed exactly. with a uh, hiring of an architect. Right. Period. Right. Okay. So if we need an amendment, John, I will go ahead and amend my uh, previous motion then to include the civil peer review to include uh, items such as landscaping and site lighting and whatever uh, else that uh, I guess you might say daytime government would deem reasonable. Mm -hmm. Do we have a second of that motion? So a question. Nick? So we're doing, we're adding on to the scope of the, uh, the engineer in lieu of doing a architectural review. Is that correct? That's right. I'm no, no, no. Okay. We're going to no. add into the civil um, lighting and landscaping as Side part work. of the civil. Work. Yeah. And then we'll go over the scope for the proposed scope for the architectural at the next meeting, which would be the 17th, too. Okay. Got it. Just to move things quickly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have a first, we have a, a motion, we have a second. Nick seconded. Uh, do we have any any other questions? Any other questions? Ready for the vote? All in favor? Of the amendment? The amendment, yeah. And then uh, that's an amendment to the motion, so it passes as a whole. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, then 
we've me. already <laughs> we've already uh, kind of put on our agenda then October the 17th would be our next um, meeting for uh, for ZBA to con continue this. Um, do I have any um, input? We have a conflict with the 17th. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. What's I'm good. What's the con? I'm not doing without G. We have <laughs> our economic development summit workshop for downtown parking and wayfinding. Actually, well, in, this we, room, in this room. So, <laughs> can we move it uh, a day ahead or so to a Thursday or something? I'm a man. This meeting's already been advertised. No, no, no. Not your meeting. Oh, oh meeting. your meeting. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we're comfortable. We've, we've been for years even and years and years on Thursdays. <laughs> yeah, even, even the following week, uh, you know. What? Yeah, the 24th might might be the best bet. Right. 24th is open? Of October. Yeah. Well, because we alternate with uh, conservation on that. Do we not? Uh, no, that doesn't matter. For you mean yeah, Kristen? Would. No. Doesn't matter if it's conservation is made. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought that ZBA did on on, uh, on one Wednesday. On one set of Wednesday, we do one and three, mm -hmm. and conservation did two and four. I think in this case, it wouldn't be a problem if conservation is scheduled to meet that night. Right, I agree. They wouldn't really. Yeah, we're at the library, mm -hmm. hopefully. Um, they're at the town hall, so town hall. I don't see a conflict. Okay, so the intention is to move it from October 17th to October 24th. Yep. Mm -hmm. That gives them another week to do the peer review, too. So. Right. Which would be probably helpful. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that's not a bad thing. Board members? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. You can't afford you to lose anybody. You need a motion on that? I do. Uh, I'll make a motion that uh, we continue the uh, meeting on uh, Eaton Lakeview 40B uh, to uh, October 24th, uh, 2018. Do we hear a second, sorry? Second. All in favor? 24th. Next 24th meeting. it is. Okay. So, Chair, I want to ask a question about the continued hearing. Absolutely. Is the intention of the board to have Green International back at that hearing again for a third time? Or, can, or are we safe to release that? I, 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 don't, I don't think that we need Green International yeah. back again. Yeah. If you Sorry, guys wait. are all seven. <laughs> yeah, no, I think we're good. Okay. Thank you. Question answered. Um, do we have any other business for the board this evening? Hearing none, do I hear a motion for adjournment? Moved. So moved. Do we hear a second? Second. Eric second. All in favor? We are adjourned. <laughs>